Hello, pod smashers of the internet, and welcome to another episode of Termite's Buzz, a normal weekly video game podcast where I, your host Termite, run you through the weekly video game news, my trophies and games that I'm playing, and a little retro discussion. However, this is a very special bonus episode. You see, I went to the video game, no, the Game Awards, live in LA, in person, with T-Bone, my brother, for his 40th birthday, and I want to share my whole experience. I want to run through the people we met, the people we saw, some some great conversations we had. I want to review the show overall, and then I want to talk about some of my favorite games that I saw as the uh, show is written with lots of announcements and things. Now, I know it's been a month since I've recorded anything. Uh, thank you for hanging on to us. If you're listening and you have been wondering where we've been, uh, I have been extraordinarily busy with the holidays uh, and life in general has kicked up crazy. I have not been able to get to the computer to record a podcast on the weekends like I usually do. Uh, I know there's been a lot of things going on in the news. It's been four weeks, so I'm not going to try to backfill any of those things. So this is just a special, like, fun little, you know, happy holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate, whatever happened kind of episode uh, about the Game Awards. And that's kind of what, you know, I like about the Game Awards timing being in December is that it's at the end of the year when usually the news is kind of bummed, you know, because people are taking off work, finishing up projects, wrapping things up. So there's not a lot of activity. Uh, And then you have the celebration of the whole year of 2023. It's great. It's a great time of year. Um, So happy solstice, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate. Uh, Merry, happy to that. Kwanzaa, what have you enjoy with your loved ones and your families so i'm just going to walk you through the the journey you know t-bone and i we flew out of charlottesville we had a layover in chicago and then we our final destination was lax and when planning this trip i took into consideration the locations of where things are spread out so one of the things t-bone mentioned was that he wanted to see the beach and so in my very first like on the trip in the airport, looking things I'm like, where do you want to go? How do we want to do the landing? Or do you want to run run out to? Or like, go see the beach? Okay, well, the Santa Monica Pier is pretty darn close to LAX as in terms of mileage, distance, like actual objective distance. It's pretty close. So like, cool. I was hemming and hawing about whether or not I wanted to drag my luggage out to the Santa Monica Pier. But you know what? I did it. I was like, okay, you only live once. We're, how often are we ever going to be back out here again together, healthy, ready to rock? So we're like, we're doing it. So we jump in an Uber from the airport and immediately go down to the Santa Monica Pier. And we have a blast. Uh, there was like some people trying to pedal some things to us, but the views are great. With some great pictures walking down the hill down to the pier. It wasn't super busy because it's like a Wednesday evening and it's December. So it's not really beach summer season, but. It was still kind of warm. It's L.A., so I'd say it was in like the mid-60s. Uh, the high that day was like 70, but the evening was approaching. We wanted to see the sunset. We wanted to grab some food, so we went to the Mexican restaurant on the very end of the Santa Monica Pier, had some food, got a margarita, and then we went around and we watched the sunset, uh, and then we walked back up off the pier up to the street side where we popped in our Uber to get back to our hotel, which was the JW Marriott uh, in L.A. Live. Um, and this is where thing, or at least the very first frustration of the whole trip happened. And it wasn't even that bad. When I say frustration, it was like, okay, it's kind of annoying, but crazy and a good learning experience nonetheless. And what happened was that the Santa Monica Pier's 14 miles from the LA Live location. And to go 14 miles, it was going to take 75 minutes. You heard that correct. An hour and 15 minutes to go 14 miles. Now, in my very fastest running days, I could ru- almost run that. Like, I would be, be a mile short, a mile behind, but I could almost run that distance at that speed. That's how bad traffic in LA is. Absolutely awful. It really is riding with the brakes. When they say LA matches the 95 corridor between Fredericksburg and DC, as far as the worst traffic in the country, I can see why. Absolutely terrible. I took a picture because it was just so unbelievable. It should not have taken that long. So we get back to JW Live. We check into the hotel. We go outside. We wander around the area. We want to go see the Peacock Theater. That's where the Game Awards show is actually going to take place. So we got some pictures. 
There's an ice skating rink. It's all festive. And we start wandering around. We start to see people in the gaming industry. And it's the night before the Game Awards, so I really didn't expect to see a lot of folks. There's a lot of things I didn't know that I'll circle back around to that I do know now. And that's this. Well, I'll tell you later. But anyway, we're wandering around the hotel. Outside, we come back, and the hotel lobby starts to fill up with some people. And in those in in those people, the very first folks we saw were none other than Andrea Renee and Brittany Brombacher sitting around a table full of I, I assume it's their spouses and maybe some industry friends, and they're having a conversation. Now, I know I needed to say hi to them. They were major. They're they had a major impact in my life. I have spent so many hours mowing my grass, driving to and from work, commuting on work travel trips on planes to various places across the country, listening to what's good games, and they were absolutely incredible and one of the foundational voices that fed my knowledge and my industry experience that I conveyed through eighty bit Pod Smash. Like they were an input, a major input, and a huge inspiration. So I had to go see them. So I walk over to Andrea specifically. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I saw Brittany's back and I knew she was there, but I was, I was hoping I could get them at the same time, but I didn't know what to do and I'm awkward. And I know they're there. Like my assumption is that the gaming industry folks are there to hang out with their friends, to see people they haven't seen in a while and to like experience it from their perspective. Maybe they're working. I don't know what they're doing. So I want to be super cautious and super careful and not like, starstruck fangirl all over the place, right? You don't want to be stupid. You kind of want to mind your own uh, and be respectful of your time. So I kind of just lean in. I'm like, hey, I'm so sorry to interrupt. You're Andrea Renee. And immediately I'm like, you probably don't know who I am because obviously she doesn't know who I am. But I'm Termite. And sometimes I comment on your show and you react. It is so nice to meet you. You are amazing and I love your content. And she was like, oh, that's wonderful. That's awesome. And basically had a conversation back and forth. Uh, that eventually turned into like talking about kids and like life changes and big stuff. And then I was like, can I talk to Brittany as well? And now Andrea stayed seated and I was standing, T-Bone and I were, and I introduced Andrea to T-Bone. I was like, hey, it's my brother. We're here for his 40th birthday. Uh, and then she, uh, I looked at Brittany and I was like, oh, can I, I want to talk to her too. And Andrea's like, oh, of course. And she goes, Brittany, hey. And then she's like, this is Termite and his brother T-Bone. Or Tommy, I don't know how we introduce each other. The details are slipping. It's been a week. Uh, so she, she looks at us and she's like, oh, hi. Then she stands up and she's like, I'm going to stand up to talk to you. And she w- kind of walks a few steps away from the table. And Brittany has a full-blown conversation, super hype about the Game Awards. And we were talking about some of the things we're excited about. Uh, she asked me what my favorite game was for the year. And I said it was Final Fantasy 16. And she was like, oh, so you like Final Fantasy then? I was like, oh, I'm a huge fan. I played them all. And then we talked briefly about the Final Fantasy IX remake that is supposedly happening. That she's like, she tweeted about that night. So I mentioned the tweet. Um, I also mentioned how bad traffic was, just trying to make conversation. And how Paris Lilly tweeted that night that L.A., Traffic was created by Satan, and then Brittany laughed and said, you shouldn't listen to anything Paris says, which is their beef. Like, it's hilarious to hear them go back and forth, and it's totally a bit. Like, they're just having fun. So we had a blast. So that was great. I was like, holy cow, I can't believe. I didn't expect this at all. I, you know, it's the night before the Game Awards. I didn't really expect gaming industry folks to be around. And that's when I, well, for them specifically, for those two ladies, they were so, so accommodating to fandom and like us, our nobodies, like wanting to have a conversation with us. They were so humble and so genuine and excited to hear about right, our stories and like where we came from and who we are. Uh, it was awesome. It was so cool. Uh, and then in walks in and around Doug Bowser. Yes the CEO of Nintendo. He's around. So I do the same thing. I know he's on a mission. He's probably got an entourage of security around that I can't even see. I don't even know. I don't know his world. I don't know what he's there for, but it's the night before. So I walk over. I'm like, Doug Bowser, it's so nice to meet you. I just want to say hi. I don't want to interrupt your night. Like just, just, I love Nintendo and it's awesome. Well, he also stopped what he was doing and started a conversation with us. And he mentioned how Super Mario Wonder, he was surprised that it was nominated for best multiplayer. He's like in the sea of what is considered multiplayer games. He's like, Mario doesn't really fit that bill, but Mario Wonder does have a good multiplayer. And I was blown away that the lead of Nintendo of America would say something kind of almost but not really critical of Mario Wonder's multiplayer features because it has an extensive feature list of like online, asynchronous play, the whole standees, the shadow play, uh, of course, the couch co-op. 
which Mario Wonder was nominated for and won Best Family Game. But also, uh, Tears of the Kingdom was nominated for Game of the Year and Best Game Direction. So I was congratulating him on his rewards, and that's what brought the conversation up, or award nominees. And that brought the conversation up about Mario Wonder. So again, super nice, super humble, just like willing to talk to nobody. Uh, it's I was continuing to be floored. So we continue to walk around. And I don't remember the exact order of events at this point. I think I've had a couple of drinks. I was getting old fashions. I had two of them. One made with tequila, which I was, uh, what? I didn't know you could make it old-fashioned with tequila. I'm getting distracted. So at some point, I saw Janet Garcia from Kind of Funny. She was there, and she also talked to us probably more than the other folks did. It seemed like she didn't have as much of an agenda, and she was super, super communicative and just talking about things and excitement of being at the show, and this is our first time here. She told me any time to like call out on streams, on any of her streams, that we talked and she would say hi again um, and I, I on Twitter and stuff. So she was super cool to talk to. Uh, and then I went around and I saw what I noticed to be the music writer and director of Sea of Stars from Sabotage, the Sabotage the Development Studio. And I remember his face because I watched a little documentary about how they made it. And I saw him and I was like, I have to go say hi to him. I didn't realize it was the entire like Sabotage team or at least the team leads the main creators. So I walk over and I'm like, you're the guy that does the the, the music for Sea of Stars. He was like, I, I did. And I was like, I absolutely love that game. Really, really great game. Again, sorry to interrupt. I don't, I'm just, I just want to say it was awesome. And it was really impactful to me. I listen to the soundtrack all the time. My sons love it. And he pointed to all of his teammates. And he was like, yeah, we're, we're the team. We all made it. And they all, again, stopped their conversation and were like super humble and awesome. They asked T-Bone, how far in the game are you? Where are you right now? And he answered some pirate ship thing and the guy was like oh it gets so good after that like just keep pushing keep playing and i was like yeah i platinumed it i i love this game so much and and after that i think was when the night kind of wound down for us um we wandered back around and grabbed our own table and just kind of sat and we were talking amongst ourselves me and t-bone about how amazing just meeting these develop or i guess yeah software developers doug bowser how we met andrea renee and Brittany brombacher like just kind of starstruck, absolutely crazy. I can't believe this happened. Now we're East Coast time, so our bodies are three hours ahead. And then by now it's like 10. So we're thinking it's like 1 a.m. to us. So we're dead. But it's actually 10 p.m. So we have some time to sleep. So we wake up the next morning. We go to bed. Like, yeah, and we're toast. Wake up the next morning around 5 in the morning because our bodies thinks it's 8. And I don't know about y'all, but if you can sleep uninterrupted from 10 to 8, that's a good night's sleep. Now, I had some drinks, so I didn't sleep perfectly, but I also didn't drink enough to like have a problem. So I woke up at 5 a.m., and I had planned the night before we were going to go to the gym and work out because nothing opens. Like Nothing is open. We're so awake and so energized at so early. So I was like, I'm going to go run for an hour in the treadmill. T-Bone got up. He went down to the gym, so we both got dressed. I needed coffee. I have like a routine. So we got coffee. I got to use the restroom. Did all that. But at the coffee, I went to Starbucks. I didn't see anyone there. That was of note. I go back up to the room, do my business, change clothes, go down to the gym. So I get on the treadmill and start rolling. It's night out still. It's dark. It's like 545 or whatever at this time. And I can only see the inside of the gym. Then the treadmill I picked was one I picked on purpose because it was right next to a window. And I wanted to look outside at something because it's a treadmill and I don't have my headphones. So I couldn't watch my phone. So I'm looking out the window, but I can't see outside. All I see is a reflection because of whatever they did to treat the window so you can't see in. Uh, And so in walks Doug Bowser and I see the reflection and I'm watching behind me and Doug Bowser works out with T-Bone like right alongside of him and some other folks too for like 45 minutes. They were in there killing it and it was amazing and they didn't say it was no, no conversation. It was just everybody's working out, minding their own business, you know, it's total gym, gym etiquette at its peak, uh, but wild to like hang out that long with Doug Bowser. Uh, It's great that he's taking care of his body doing what he's got to do because sometimes you just get up in that business world and you know like s- priorities get shifted and like suddenly you're not taking care of yourself uh but i love that he was so that was really really cool and man i gotta remember where else we- all right so we woke up that day i uh, went up that you know take a shower clean up we went to get breakfast and we're like okay we're gonna go see hollywood so we're going out get our uber Again, it's like stupid expensive for Ubers and it takes forever because traffic is bad even at that early in the morning. We get to Hollywood at like 9, 9 or so, 9.30. We want to do the Hollywood Walk of Fame because it's self-guided. We don't have to be anywhere. It doesn't end at a certain time. We're on our own. 
and we want to be fl- free and flexible in case we need to get out to go back to the LA Live area JW Marriott Hotel so we can change and get ready for the awards. We don't definitely don't want to miss that. So we're walking up and down Hollywood. Kind of a dump. Not going to lie. Like, Hollywood's very... It's, it's pretty dirty. Uh, there's a lot of bars and night scene areas. Of course, we're at 9.30 in the morning and it's all closed. So maybe it looks a little more alive at night. But during the morning, it was uh, there was a lot of um, people bad on their luck around. Uh, I saw some crazy stuff. Walk around them and just kind of move on. You get heckled. Uh, but as things started to open up, there was a lot of grifters. Like, come take a tour on our bus. I'm like, no, I'm not getting in this bus with you. I don't know who you are, and this bus isn't even marked. Where are you going to take me? Come see celebrity houses. And I was like, no. Uh, But there was actually, like, official tours that were, like, branded that you could find online reviews and stuff that do go take tours of celebrity houses, and that's just not our deal. So we went to go see the Chinese theater. The Chinese theater definitely seems old, but it was kind of cool because it is so iconic. Uh, I got some pictures uh, it was really, really nice and really, really fascinating to see that that area of Hollywood, the Chinese Theater and the Dolby Theater are right next to it. And then kind of across the street is where Jimmy Kimmel Live is. Uh, and there's a Disney th- a theater where you can like have a more authentic theater experience. I-, I don't really know what that means. It just seemed advertised to have like it was a special. They played retro Disney movies. So that was pretty cool. Took a bunch of pictures, walked all around in and out of gift shops. Uh, started to get a little tired. We didn't really know what we wanted to do to fill the rest of the day in. Um, the Dolby the Dolby Theater was there. That's where the Oscars are when they happen. And so we walked in and around that area. There's like a retail space with the Ben and Jerry's and some other things that was kind of nice and dressed up. We got a picture of the Hollywood sign. Of course, you got to do that. Um, but we kind of ran out of things to do. And then we were just sitting around looking at like what we wanted to do. Uh, I couldn't really fill out the rest of the day. I was getting really hungry because I had ran that morning. And so I was like, I oh, haven't been walking around. I had so many steps that day. So tired. My feet and legs were like given out. So we want to go at some point on this trip. We knew we wanted in and out burger. So I sat down and like looked up where the nearest one was. And there's one on Sunset Boulevard, which runs parallel to the Hollywood Boulevard. And it's one block apart. So we just walked down one block. in and out burger was there. I walk in. The place is crazy busy crazy busy but it's also really really nice and clean the parking lot the outside the inside in a sea of like the dumps that area of the sunset boulevard was even worse than hollywood boulevard it was like walking even into the more like decrepit area of a city you know all the big metropolitan areas have like your your more nice places and your more not so nice places and sunset boulevard was like condemned buildings and boarded things up even dirtier and more trash on the street sidewalks not kept up not clean uh and so we we took a long walk down sunset boulevard and there was just nothing nothing to see or do there so that's when we went to in and out burger and that was the contrast was like oh my gosh this is like super nice and clean i can't believe this one corner of a street has kept up so well but it was also like chick-fil-a busy which if you're out here you know that like every chick-fil-a is crazy packed all the time uh line wrapped around the drive through well that's how in and out was so we go in and there's a little bit of a line but it's moving and i get up to the register and i heard the person next to me order like the menu is very simple it's just like double cheeseburger cheeseburger uh fries and, and like milkshakes i don't even know if they had shakes maybe soda i don't know i didn't check that out but a very very simple menu so i'm ordering and i hear the person next to me say they wanted theirs animal style and that's not on the menu i I looked i was like what is animal style so i get up to the register i'm like yeah what's animal style and she said oh it's where they put grilled onions and like sauce on and cheese on your fries and then on the burger they put more sauce and they put grilled onions in a pickle and I was like, that sounds amazing. Yes. I would like a double cheeseburger combo, animal style. And she's like, oh, where are you guys from? Like, clearly, she knew from whatever expressions I was laying out that I was not from the area. So I talked to her about you know being from the East Coast. We don't have In-N-Out Burger out there. Uh, so we sat down and ate. I took a picture of the meal. It was amazing. It was so good. It's like, it's like a cheap, fast Five Guys, I guess. Like that level of quality and that kind of food. Um totally worth the hype for us you know it's a west coast staple i know a lot of people think it's overrated i think chick-fil-a is overrated so i get it like if i totally understand why some folks would say that's overrated but we don't really have anything like that around here the closest thing i remember to having in fredericksburg area was an a and w burger joint that had similar 
like vibe that in and out Burger does. But really, we have like a McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, and Five Guys, and those are all kind of different in their own ways. So in and out is different enough to be worth it and delicious. It was a lot of fun. So I feel like I'm rambling now, but we get out of lunch. We go back to the hotel to get ready for the game awards. We wanted some downtime, some quiet time. So we went up to the room, just like laid out. I was hoping to fall asleep, but I couldn't because I was too jazzed about the show. But we ended up killing like a half hour, just chilling, scrolling on the phone, checking out what everybody's doing on Twitter, when and where everywhere is around. We go, we get dressed, we go back down. The area is starting to fill up with different industry folks, but no one I notice. We go outside, we get a picture, and then we go out and stand in line to go in. And there wasn't anybody that I noticed that I knew from the industry around until I met Jake from Game Explain. So Game Explain is a YouTube channel content creator f- that focuses a lot on Nintendo stuff. And if you've seen Jacob Jake's contents, um, I, he's there. You can go find him. He's on Twitter too. Uh, so I had a long conversation with him, which was pretty awesome. And he was mentioning how he would be willing to do an interview on the show. I just need to reach out to him. So I'm now contemplating doing an interview with Jake from Game Explained. Game Explained is is pretty famous, popular for doing like a lot of analytical videos, like graphics comparisons or deep dives, Easter eggs, analysis on various Nintendo games. So that was really cool. And then the doors opened and everyone flooded in. The lobby was crazy, very, very busy. Couldn't really move around. I was hunting for folks in the industry, but also looking out for where our seats were. Uh, so we go over and find our seats. We go, we sit down. I guess we're like, if you're looking at the stage, we're on the far right. Uh, and there was a big jig jib camera kind of almost in our way, almost annoying, but not, not totally obtrusive, which I wish I would have known. Otherwise I would have picked different seats. But at this point I'm there, I'm hype. I'm excited. This It'll be fine. It'll be good. The show happens, which I'm going to run through the stuff in the show and my feelings about the show after I go through this. Cause I just want to talk about, our experience first and then the second half of my recording will be about the show so then the show all happens everything's great we're leaving we're walking out oh fozzy shout out to fozzy he follows us on twitter he says he's a freelancer i don't know any of his show souls or content but he was sitting next to me on my right he was super cool he like followed us back out to the lobby because i wanted a drink and we were figuring that whole situation out and i had my drink but they don't let drinks into the auditorium so i basically got to chug a 16 ounce ipa like outside in the hallway which that's my, my, my game, right? That's what I do. I love doing that kind of crap. But so we walked around trying to find some industry folks and see who we could run into, get a picture, say hi. This was all way before the show started. So it wasn't like we were like late. But anyway, by the time we got to the show and sat down, we were a little early, just chilling in the auditorium, waiting for the show to start. Cause I wanted to be like on ready to go. Um, they don't allow photography or videos to happen inside the auditorium. Although if you follow social media, you'll know that a lot of people violated those rules. Myself included, I got a ton of pictures. I didn't take any videos. I just took pictures for myself. Um, so the show went. It happened. It's all over with. We leave. Um, everyone's around. I did fail to mention that in the hotel, I did see Reggie fils I saw Todd Howard um, all walk by. Phil Spencer and Sarah Bond, I saw walking around. I never had a chance to talk to them. Uh, so on leaving, leaving the Game Awards... There's like the VIP roped off section and that was for those folks I just mentioned and I saw them all again. So they're like in a spot I couldn't get to. Uh, And that was Todd Howard and Reggie and Sarah Bond and and Philip Spencer and all those folks. That's fine. So we're like walking out and lo and behold, there's no one talking to him. There's Greg Miller just standing there. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to go say hi to Greg. And I didn't feel so bad this time because he wasn't looking like he was on a mission and he had no one around him. Blessing was sort of close by and I wanted to catch them both, but I went straight to Greg Miller and I was like, Greg Miller. And he was like, oh, he was kind of surprised at who I went. Like, I was just full confidence. Just bam, you're Greg Miller. You don't know who I am. I'm Termite. Well, hi, Termite. And it's my brother, T-Bone. Well, I call him Tommy. We're here for his 40th birthday. And then I just went, you know, on a, he was asked, we went back and forth. So I told him, you know, like I've been following you since IGN starting kind of funny, your, uh, trending gamer of the year award really like pushed me over the edge to, to watch kind of funny even more and like do my own podcast and just our history of watching Greg. It's great to meet him finally. Uh, and then he was asking like, what did you think of the show? And like, I told him about the podcast, like I have this podcast I've been running for seven years. So we kind of just went like a little, like he asked what, what stood out as my favorite. And I was like, you know, that's kind of a, a critical uh, point of the show is that they started to run together and I don't have a list in front of me. He kind of laughed and he was like, yeah, that's why I have a list in front of me before my shows. And I was like, yep, I understand. Like 
we we got a click. Like we had a little understanding. It was great. Um, again, forgot to get a picture, which I'm super bummed about. But he was extremely nice, super approachable, like really, really humble. Gave me time of day. It was like not trying to get out of the conversation at all. He was just standing there. You could tell he wasn't trying to move on. And he was just talking about like, how would you like the show? This is great. We love being here. All this kind of stuff. Uh, awesome conversations all around with folks. I think that may have been the last actual person I talked to. Oh, nope. There's there's two more. So we leave, go outside. The crowd's everywhere. The streets are run. I'm starving. Like, starving. We had that In-N-Out burger at like one. And by now, it's eight. And I had no food. Anywhere in between. So I'm like, food now. Let's go. And there's a sea of people like a zombie apocalypse migrating to all the restaurants that are around in walking distance. So as we were walking out toward where we wanted to go, I was trying to find like where the crowd was the thinnest and then find something that T-Bone and I could agree on to eat because other restaurants seemed really packed. So there'd be a super long wait. And I'm like, I don't want to wait in line and like take forever to eat because I want to go back and see if we can run into more folks and like mingle with the industry folks more. And he agreed. He's like, yeah, I don't want us to do that either. So as we're walking out, we see Ben Starr, which is the voice actor for Final Fantasy 16's Clive, run into him. Tell him how amazing his content is and how much we love Final Fantasy 16. We grabbed a quick picture. I actually do have a picture of him. Uh, and then we kept walking. And then we went to a restaurant. Very, very short stab, which is why it was empty almost. So there was seemingly no wait, but then there ended up being waits for everything. So we shot ourselves in the foot there. Um, had some food. Came back out. Walked back to the JW Marriott. And it was wall to wall. You couldn't move anywhere. And we <laughs> stood in line to get a drink. And it just, I just stood there for so long that uh, I ran into someone who worked on the cinematics for Star Wars Jedi Survivor. I don't think he was affiliated with Respawn or EA. He was just an animation team developer person. Maybe he worked for Respawn as a subsidiary or something. But I talked to him for a while. And I, the only thing I remember about that conversation is he, the podcast had come up and he was interested in, he was asking a bunch of questions. And then I said, yeah, we're kind of sunsetting the podcast. We're working on like kind of ending it. And he's like, why you seem so passionate and so into video games in the industry. Like, why would you do that? And I was like, he sees me. He sees me y'all. It was wild. So finally get a drink, come back around. Alana Pierce is there. So I go say hi to Alana. Alana, you're awesome. I love your content. Your journey is amazing. Take a picture. I turn around and there's Raul. Raul is an actor. He stars in Midnight Mass and ha House, The Fall of the House of Usher. I was, uh, what? He's not even in the gaming industry. He's just around. And I was like, so I shook his hand. Yeah, your shows are awesome. Great. Thanks. Move on. I mean, at this point, it was just a rapid fire. And then I go down and around and I run into Fran, Mil Fran Mirabella, who's also used to be an IGN. He was involved in Kind of Funny. He did some Kind of Funny Games Daily stuff for a long time. Ran into him. Had a little brief conversation with him as well. Everyone in everyone is just so nice. I just didn't expect, you know, I, I figured these are all industry busy people that have their lists, their agenda, their things to do. Uh, and they were all so ready to have a conversation with just a fan who appreciates their stuff and consumes their content. I, I'm blown away. Um, some other folks like shout out to shout outs of people I saw, but didn't interact with. I saw Daniel Bloodworth. Well, Tommy did T-Bone did. Uh, I saw Ryan McCaffrey walking around and I saw Naomi Kyle from a distance and all those folks. I saw Shuhei Yoshida. I did shake his hand in the bathroom at the game awards when I was like on the way out as I realized who it was. I had seen him in the hotel the night before and didn't rec recognize. I mean, I knew he was, I was like, who is that? So I did some sleuthing and found out, I was like, that's Shuhei Yoshida. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. He's a head of PlayStation in independent developer game. Like the, the wing of Sony PlayStation that deals with all things indie and like getting indie content on PlayStation, that's Shuhei Yoshida. So I shook his hand in the, in the bathroom right before the Game Awards show started. Uh, and I just like, yeah, that was a really, really quick. He's Japanese, and I don't. I'm an, an idiot American. I have no clue. I probably offended him and didn't even know it. Uh, shook his hand, like bowed a little bit, just like thank you, your content, you're awesome. Like love that. Um, PlayStation's great, and move on. I don't even remember exactly what I said. I'm just like trying to recall a memory from a week ago, and it was so everything was happening so fast. You're just surrounded by all these people that you want to talk to. Some other folks in the midst of all of this. Uh, I think at the hotel prior to the show, when I was dressed up, I remember being dressed up, having these conversations. 
uh, there was a guy named Mike or Matt from IGN's marketing wing uh, that was there. And he works in and out of the LA office. They have a San Francisco office and an LA office. And he sat and talked with us for a while. Uh, he got up and left. And then some other folks came and sat down. And they were from 2K Games Marketing. And they leveraged technologies to various 2K studios. So like Rockstar, Gearbox, the developers that do the sports games, how they want to market and do PR for their titles, they work through this team. And that was uh, Alan and Rebecca. And they both sat with us and talked with us for a while. And then they had some other like super businessy people come over, like dressed to the nines, talking about business. They were like talking about going to New York the next week for the holidays and like getting deals and like meeting up. Like clearly they work together. So T Bone and I just got up and like y'all can have the table. Like you're just doing work stuff. Bye. <laughs> nice to meet you. And so that was pretty funny. No rudeness at all. It was totally cordial and everything was fine. But yeah, so that's thirty minutes. Our whole like three day trip. Uh, we woke up the next morning, got some coffee and breakfast, and like went back. And there was a crazy taxi driver. Yes, crazy taxi, pun intended. This driver was insane. I tried to call an Uber, but it was going to be a 12-minute wait. And we needed to get to the airport. We weren't late, but we needed to go. So I went outside the hotel, has taxi cab drivers like waiting right there from from the hotel for anyone who needs one. And we get in this in this cab. This dude does not know how to hold the gas pedal in a steady way. He constantly pushes it to the floor and then let's go. And then to the floor and let's go. So he's revving his engine. He drives like a maniac. He runs up on people, slows down, no consistency. He was like by far the worst driver of all of our Ubers. And he was cussing Ubers the whole time. And he had this really, really strong Asian dialect. So he was trying to talk to us and it was kind of hard to understand. But I got out of him. He hated, he was like comparing him the taxi system to the Uber system the whole time, which was really funny. Uh, but he was awful as far as it, he got us there. He got us there quickly and efficiently and safe. So I can't say he couldn't do his job. He did. He did his job. But it was nuts. And it was hilarious. I didn't feel unsafe. It was just wild. Just nuts. We got on a plane. All the travel was great. All the planes were fine. Everything on time. Airports were cool. I got Chicago hot dogs on the way home because we had a longer layover in Chicago on the way home than on the way out. So we sat at a restaurant out there at the airport. I got Chicago style. It has a slice of tomato cut in half on it. It has a, a pickle spear on it. And it has a peppers on it on a poppy seed bun uh, with like some green relish. No ketchup, no mustard. It was awesome. It was so good. But I love hot dogs. and I'm really hard to please. So I don't know how people think of Chicago style hot dogs, but that was fantastic. Uh, it was cool to, to get that. And I explained that exact scenario to a couple of folks in my neighborhood who used to live in Chicago. And they said, yep, that's a Chicago style hot dog. Like you nailed it. Now I'm going to transition to what I actually thought of the Game Awards show, and then we'll go into the, my favorite announcements. So the Game Awards review overall, the whole show. So when you're there in person, it really does give you a context for like how professional this is, how something like this gets executed. You're there in the audience. There is space. There are people walking on and off the stage. Like the camera is so isolating when you watch it from home that you kind of don't get like the stage vibe of what's happening for this major, major production. It's a massive production. It takes a lot of work to go into it. And it was really cool to be able to like see that in person. I mean, it's the same reason why you go see a show live instead of just watching everything from your couch, right? It's the whole like the experience is much, much better. The screens are amazing. The sound system is amazing. So you see all of that. Like you get it. Like all the folks that are in the industry that are there know or have had conversations with Jeff Keighley and they kind of like that's the club. You know, I'm visiting the I'm the big gaming industry club and they all kind of understand each other. Um, so I'm hype. You know, everyone's hype. Everyone's having a great time. We're all ready to rock. So as things were happening, the critiques of the show after the fact were sort of sinking in. But it's wild that like in the moment, it you don't really get it until you like take a look at the whole show from a different perspective when it's over. Or I guess if you're working if you're watching it from home, you can really see it. It's like super obvious. So the critics are really harsh about the show, but they're right. The speeches were way too short. Jeff Keeley recognized that and said like halfway through the show, he started to tell the staff, the production staff, to relax the 30 second timer and not to be so strict with it. Um but the speeches were way too short for what they got. And it was 30 seconds, and you could see the timer. I saw the the teleprompter live. Like, I could turn my head and see the teleprompter was counting down from 30. Uh, and Jeff recognizes that right away and starts to, I guess, we didn't know that till after the fact, but he tweeted about it. So, 
So lots of time given to like Hollywood actors. So Michael McConaughey or Matthew McConaughey, I can't, Matthew McConaughey was there. He set that on stage. Um, uh, Timothy Chalamet. There was, um, let's see, Gonzo, of course. Gonzo was awesome. He was there. Yep. It, it was Anthony Mackie, Simu Liu, Timothy Chalamet, Gonzo, Matthew McConaughey. Those were the holiday Hollywood actors. Uh, they had way more stage time than any of the speeches. And that is not cool, right? Like, you're looking and talking to your whole entire audience is developers, video game people, right? And you see someone who wins an award, who worked really, really hard, who sacrificed so much of their life, go up on stage and start talking to be musicked off the stage within 30 seconds. And then you see, like, Simu Liu had a cast on his leg, and he went on about that. And Matthew McConaughey went on about uh, having time dilation experience and uh, all right, all right, all right. And then Anthony Mackie was, like, heckling the audience, telling them all to shut up for like minutes. Uh, of course, Hideo Kojima had a, had a thing with Jordan Peele uh, and that lasted three minutes or something. So I don't know how the math shook out, but it was like 12 minutes of actual developer speeches across the three and a half hour show. And so kind of like on the nose in front of everyone in a year where layoffs are happening, tons and tons of layoffs have happened. So the developers are all aware that their friends and family have lost their jobs and everyone's down on their luck. And then to have like their awards, their moment, their chance to talk kind of ripped away from them. And I know one of the Larian developers who won for Boulder's Gate 3 started to talk about a death on the development team. It may have been the guy who received the award for Game of the Year. And right as it, it looks bad, but right as he was talking about the loss of the development team who lost their life, the music started playing to whisk them off. Now, no one's behind the stage like, oh, hey get off the stage. I don't care what you're saying. This was clearly like they were prompted in advance. You have a 30 second speech, get together what you want to say. Uh, and then the production staff, they're not paying attention to what is actually happening. They're just trying to do this show logistically, like to move it along. So it was, it was a combination of a bunch of bad stuff. But when you put it all together and you put it on TV across the entire internet and you beam it there, it's like, Oh, a, a winner of an award is talking about how impactful uh, the game that they made was and how meaningful it was in addition to the loss of a developer on the team uh, and how that person's life was so meaningful as well. And then to be have the music interrupt and like, nope, you can't talk about that. You know, it looks bad. It's bad optics, even though it wasn't intentional. So these are sort of the critiques. The awards were not giving spaces for speeches. Um, some of them were just listed off like best indie game did go to see a stars. And after talking to them in the JW uh, Marriott lobby and how excited they were and so humble about their game and had, like passionate about it. And clearly they put their lives into this game and they were not able to give a speech. We don't know the background story. We don't know if they opted not to have a speech in advance of the show or if they didn't want, if no one felt comfortable enough to go up on stage to give the speech. We don't know. I have no idea. There's a combination of all these different things, but it just looks bad. And everyone's like brain is exploding. Uh, oh yeah, Jason Schreier. I saw him also at the JW Marriott. Uh, he's correct. You ha having both announcements and the awards. There's space for both. Uh, the problem is that Hollywood is getting more time than the developer award speeches, and that just looks bad. That is bad. That's not good. If you're going to be an award show, be an award show. If you're going to be an announcement show, be an announcement show. Uh, some people are saying there should be two separate events. Uh, I think I'm of this opinion of Jason Schreier. I think there's room for both. I just You just have to tweak it. It's just got to be balanced better because the show was amazing. It was produced perfectly. It had great announcements, probably some of the best. It was well-paced. The good announcements were from the beginning to the end. Sometimes you have shows that have like a 45-minute lull where everyone's like yawning, going to sleep, and like kind of done. This didn't have that. Um, so like the placement and what the announcements were were amazing. Probably one of the best we've had of the last 10 game awards. But when you look at who's talking, who's got the mic, what the time is distributed to, it just needs to be shifted and balanced differently. Uh, clearly Jeff Keighley needs to make money on the show. It has to generate income somehow. So there's going to be like cameos and call outs and ads and all of this stuff like around. 
Uh, but the he has continuously said that this is not the Oscars of video games. If it was, it would just be awards. So we're not going for that. The video game industry is not the movie industry. It's not the book industry. It's not the music industry. It's video games. It is a separate industry that's so unique and totally on its own. And it's such an amazing art form and industry. All by itself, it's it's different. It doesn't really mirror anything else. It's interactive. Interactive entertainment. It's software. It's development, right? It also has animation and sound and movies, like kind of all combined. It's like so multimedia and, and the, plus the internet and the social aspect of video games. It's very unique. So having an award show that stands out as a unique event, I think is necessary. That That's what needs to happen. And that's what is here. That's what the game awards are. When you're talking to someone who doesn't understand the gaming industry, it's easy to just one sentence say, it's the Oscars of video games. That's what it is. That's where I went to go. That's what I went to see. But Really, it's its own show. It's its own thing. It has the announcements, the E3 grab. It also has the awards. And this year, the awards got the super small slice of the pie, and it was very noticeable, and the entire internet blew up about it. So I hope next year it's balanced a little more towards the developers because if you don't have developers, you don't have video games. If you don't have the video games, you don't have the announcements. If you don't have the announcements, you don't have the pull or the attention, the monetary, the monetization. You're not going to get Hollywood actors. You're not going to get anything. The whole show falls apart. So really, it is all hinging on the developers and the producers. The people who make the games are the ones that are the reason for that show to exist. So it needs to be refactored, redone, like balanced to that fact. And that's my opinion, my take. I agree with the folks that are out there saying these things. So go check those out. All of that said, let's talk about the announcements. Um, and I don't even know the award winners yet. I don't have I have them all in my head, but there were no big upsets. Everything was kind of predicted that Baldur's Gate 3 would sweep. Uh, Game of the Year, of course, went to Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, the Player's Voice Award, which is entirely 100% fan voted, Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, ongoing game, Cyberpunk. Content Creator of the Year, Iron Mouse Best Adaptation, which was the film adapta- movie, uh, The Last of Us, which I, it, you know, is either that or Mario, and both were nominated. Best mobile game, Honkai Star Rail. Best multiplayer game, Baldur's Gate 3. Best narrative, Alan Wake 2. Most anticipated game, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, best independent game, Sea of Stars. Best studio game direction was Epic Games with Alan Wake 2 uh, and Remedy Entertainment. Family game, Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Best art direction, Alan Wake 2. Best role-playing game, Baldur's Gate 3. Best action game, Armored Core 6. Best or best game for impact was Chia. And best action adventure was none other than Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. So Nintendo did pull through with one award for the for the night, considering Breath of the Wild got game of the year in 2017. So that's fine. All those were good. We celebrated them all. No big upsets, nothing crazy. Uh, at least from my perspective, anyway. But some of the games that I do want to call out that I'm very excited about. Uh, Windblown from the Dead Cells developers. This looks like a third, uh, a three-player co-op, top-down, ridiculously stylish, anime, graphic style, like Dead Cells. Um, hack and slash type game, and it showed really well. Uh, a game called No Rest for the Wicked from the development studio that made Ori in the Blind Forest. Uh, published by Private Division, looks next level. Next level animations, the gorgeous, gorgeous backgrounds, looks awesome. The gameplay looks fantastic. Again, like top-down, isometric, sort of platformer, hack-and-slash type game, so go check that out. Persona 3 got like an update, the remake that's coming in February 2024. Uh, that showcased well. Uh, one of the cool hype moments in the show, was, and then, again, this is like totally just being there in the audience, was the, the presentation of god of war ragnarok's free dlc so it showed like a chair in the water and everyone was just kind of like "Ooh," you know fozzy was in my ear like "Ooh, death stranding 2 here we go and i'm like uh maybe we'll see and then it shows kratos and the crowd went nuts like whoa you know it showcased the whole dlc and then everybody when the date came up it was like december 2023 and everyone just went nuts like oh and then the date was like the 15th or whatever and that was a really cool high energy like excitement level like announcement that was really awesome uh arts type entertainment a division of wizards of the coats coast announced exodus that's when matthew mcconaughey came out talked about his time dilation game um so that that showcased well there was a little bit of gameplay in there very much looks like returnal but i we don't really know a whole lot about it other than it's like third person 
space travel. Um, I thought it showcased well. I'm looking forward to it. And then Sega had this awesome trailer, which of course you can go watch all this stuff. It showed like some teens in their like apartment, like hanging out playing video games, and then like cuts to Jet Set Radio Future and Streets of Rage, Shinobi, Golden Axe, Crazy Taxi, and they announced all five of those games are getting completely remade, and the crowd went wild. Like everyone's like, "Whoa, that's awesome!" So another high energy moment. Uh, there was another Japanese RPG. These aren't in order, by the way. Uh, called Metaphor de Fantasio. And it was uh, from the developers of the Persona series uh, at Atlas, and they showed like a Microsoft exclusive um, game that looked awesome. So I, I want to know more about that. I'm going to be following it, and I do want to talk about Hideo Kojima's next game. So he did come out on stage, but what's unique about this whole moment was he walked out on stage through a PT door. So it was on the stage itself was a big box with the door and a little light over it, directly pulled from PT. And out walks Hideo Kojima. And everyone cheers like, yay, you know, we're all expecting it. And then he talks about some stuff and the translator translates what he says. He wants to announce his new game and then he wants to announce his partner and then out walks Jordan Peele. And of course, the crowd went crazy. Like, oh my gosh, some people had predicted that this was happening. Uh, it goes on and on. There's a little trailer showcased for his new game called OD. It's going to be like a horror experience, but it's nothing we've ever played before. Totally new and different. Like he said the same thing about Death Stranding. But this whole time, I'm thinking P-T, two letters, stands for playable trailer. O-D, which we don't know what it stands for. There was some sleuthing that was like oxygen deprivation or something. Whatever. The P-T door, the two-letter name, and the fact that P-T was under Konami and Kojima was not able to finish that title. It was supposed to be a Silent Hills game. I'm wondering if O-D with Jordan Peele is now the fully fledged, fully realized version of his vision that he started in PT that got ripped out from under him with Koji or with Konami. And I think that's what this is. Like why else would he walk through a PT door? Like if he wants to connect his content that he's showing to anything in his past, he just did that. Right. Why would he wouldn't, it's not for nothing. Right. And you don't get anything for free, just like video games. Like when you develop the sky, the smoke, the God rays of light through the trees, Every single thing, you, you don't get anything for free in a video game. It's all like purposely, meticulously put there by someone sitting behind a computer. And I think this is the case. You have a PT box on stage. They wanted to announce it this exact way for a reason. And so I think OD really is connected to PT. Now, it may be the same world. It might be the same related. But if Konami owns any of that IP, which is the Silent Hill IP too, like he can't use it. But he can still do the same thing with just a different IP, which OD could be that. Uh, and I'm excited about it. Looks awesome. Can't wait to hear more. We're not going to see this game until like 2028. So who knows? There was a new Mana game announced. Visions of Mana looked amazing. I know they did the remake of Trials of Mana came out, and I was interested in that, but I never actually circled around to it. So to see a new entry in the game in this hype moment, like there's really no lulls when you're in person. Everything looks awesome. So you have your rose-colored glasses, you're sitting in the audience, the whole crowd's going, because there's something for everybody, so there's always somebody cheering, somebody getting really excited about stuff. Really love the Jurassic Park survival. If you go back and look at that trailer, uh, Penguin actually texted me during this moment, and he was mad about this because they were like ripping off scenes from the original Jurassic Park, seemingly. But the idea of Jurassic Park survival is that there's one person left behind when everybody else evacuates. And so it's a call out to the original movie with some of the scenes in the trailer, like the kitchen scene with the raptor. But in this case, it's this lady who is left behind. First off, shout out that it's a brown woman as the main protagonist. That's awesome. And so she's in the kitchen doing the whole thing the kids did. But instead of it being a velociraptor chasing after her, it's the thing that sprayed what's his Newton in the face. Uh, and then there was another scene with the T-Rex at the end, the big reveal, and she lit a flare. Now, in the original movie, the flare was used to direct the T-Rex away from the kids, which is what Penguin was mad about because there were no kids here. And instead, she was just directing the T-Rex at herself. But it's just a call out to the original movie. It's just to show you that this is the same island, same cat, like not cast, but like same world. You know, it's a direct sequel from the first movie, which makes me very excited. My only stipulation here is that it's a survival game. And those don't usually resonate with me, and I kind of don't like them. But whatever. I I'm interested in this. I'm going to follow it until it comes out. Check out reviews, etc. Team Ninja showcased a PlayStation exclusive Rise of Ronin. Rise of the Ronin, which we'd known about before. We had seen it, but this was like an updated like trailer for it. I got a new trailer and a release date of March 22nd. So hopefully I can have Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Persona 3 done by then, because I'm totally into this game. If 
if and only if it has some difficulty adjusters because this looks Ninja Gaiden hard. It's Team Ninja. And I was like, ah, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I don't have time to die over and over again. A new Dragon Ball game was shown off, Dragon Ball Sparking Zero, which is the Budokai Tenkaichi successor uh, developed by Spike Chunsoft. Uh, that had a really great showing. Looks really cool. Apparently, the Dragon Ball Sparking Z- Dragon Ball Sparking is a whole different series, so it's related to that. I'm not super into the Dragon Ball lore to know what that is, but the game looked awesome. And I was like, this is next-gen anime games right now. We are here. We've made it. Um, Stormgate RTS looked really cool. That's what Simu Liu was there to announce that his work on that. Uh, I, I haven't seen an RTS since StarCraft II that looked interesting at all, and this does. So I'm going to follow that, see what it's like. Of course, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth had a live music segment uh, and a trailer showcasing some new stuff, which I didn't expect. Stuff like Sid Highwind was revealed for the first time with his voice. It showed the scene that involves Aerith, uh, but it didn't show the whole scene, just the beginning of it and her little prayer at the temple. Um, so that was kind of hype. There is There was another announcement of Marvel Blade, which is uh, developed by Arca- Arcane... There's a, a there's two different studios. It's not Arcane that made um, Redfall. It's Arcane that made Deadpool. Is it called Dead? Not Deadpool. That's oh my gosh, Death Proof. What is the name of that game? Oh my gosh, I'm a fake gamer, y'all. Arcane Lion. They made it. They're making it. The new Blade game, and it was this awesome trailer that show, showed like a barbershop, and is Death Loop. That's the name of the game. It's Death Loop. And they were, like, assisted by developers to make Redfall. But, yeah, Marvel's Blade, it's a Vampire Hunter. So it was like a, a barbershop with a bunch of crosses. That was crazy. And then it, it was like, boom, this is Blade. And no in, no indication that it's an Xbox exclusive or on Game Pass, even though it's published by Bethesda, by an Arcane Studio, which is a Microsoft studio. So that's kind of weird. Still hasn't solved that mystery. I think... The greatest takeaway from the whole show. So those are my favorite things that were announced as far as video games. Stuff that I was in. You see, I was a huge list. So I'm gonna I took notes, so I'll follow along and I'll figure it out as things get more closer to release date. A lot of 2025, 2024 stuff. But my single moment in the show, I thought it was gonna be Gonzo, which was funny, but it was short. My favorite moment in the show was the old gods of Asgard and their musical performance. And it was absolutely incredible. It was so hype. I wanted to get up and like jump and pump my fist in the air. The game, the part of Alan Wake 2 where you hear that song is so good and so impactful that when you see this live, they had pyrotechnics and the dancing. And oh, it's so good. I was listening to the soundtrack in my car this week. I've rewatched the video. You should too. Go to YouTube and check out the Game Awards. Like all the stuff that I just mentioned is all there, of course. Uh, awesome. So what an epic experience, bucket list level trip here. We've always wanted to do, me and T-Bone have dreamed of things like E3 or PAX or the big conventions, and we never were able to make it happen, either like financially or just timing wise. And this time I pushed for it. I was like, he's turning 40. Let's go big. Let's do this. So we did, and we flew across the country for two nights to go watch the Game Awards in person and see all these industry folks, all these situationally famous people, and it was just awesome. Had an absolute blast. I have to go back at some point. I, I don't know when it'll happen, but we're going back. We're going to do it again, and it's it's going to be sweet. And I, I would love... I wish that it wasn't so expensive that I could just make this a yearly thing. I wish flying wasn't so expensive and hotels expensive and such. Like Traveling in general, everything's so cost like so pricey i would love to make this a yearly thing and maybe if we get a few folks we could split the hotel room as many ways as we can and we can each just buy our own plane ticket and everything else can kind of be divided maybe we could get penguin involved at some point and we could just make this a trip that would be sweet uh there's airbnbs to research so with a little work maybe we can lower the cost and make this a little more attainable each year especially as my children grow up it becomes easier for me to get away so overall the game awards 2023 absolutely incredible i i hate that the developers weren't showcased enough during the show itself and that the show is kind of tainted with that sort of controversy um and in the that kind of controversy in the in the wow the podcasters and journalist spaces in its reception as a show i hate that that was kind of tainted but it's fine because it will figure it out. I think Jeff Keighley's a good, trustable man. He's going to f- 
work this the next year and make changes and reflect what the industry is saying he usually does in the past he's usually amicable to that stuff so there you have it that's our game awards experience that's what i'm looking forward to i can't wait I just finished this the Final Fantasy 16 DLC and it's absolutely incredible and I've downloaded and installed the, the God of War DLC and I can't wait to play that. There's trophies added for each one so I want to knock those things out and have a good time this holiday break. I don't know when you'll hear from me again. I'm hoping to jump back in here. I'm still working with Penguin to try and figure out our last hoorah for 80-bit Pod Smash and who knows how long that show is going to last because we have so much to talk about. So stay tuned to our socials. Go to 80bitpodsmash.com, 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website with a link tree that has access to all of our socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, TikTok, or everywhere. And if you are finding me through some media outlet and you have no idea where to find my audio show, we have Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, all the podcast services, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, etc. We're there. And maybe, just maybe, I can get that interview with Jake from Game Explained. And you'll want to stay, stay subscribe to us, stay tuned, etc. Go to twitch.tv slash 80bitpodsmash. Maybe we'll do some live streams over the holiday break. And you can come hang out with us. We'll be around. And with that, I'll see you later. <laughs>